السلام عليكم I'm Professor Dr. Haider Jawad Mubarak This is a brief presentation to practical aspects about uh, the Inguana region The Inguana region is simply a passage or a space in the anterior uh, abdominal wall actually it is in the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall it is located above in me the medial half of the inguinal ligament uh, this subject is very important which is the inguinal canal or inguinal region because uh, this region is a weak region in the anterior abdominal wall weak region in the lower part of the anterior abdominal wall the inguinal canal uh, contains the spermatic cord in male of course in female you don't have spermatic cord you have uh, the so called round ligament of the uterus instead of the spermatic cord and in addition to the spermatic cord the inguinal canal contain a nerve which is shown in this figure uh, that is the ilioinguinal nerve which is the L1 nerve you learn this nerve as one of the nerves supplying the muscles of the anterior abdominal wall you can see it here it is running between the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis and the neurovascular plane and then descend to run in the inguinal canal with the spermatic cord and coming to there ilioinguinal nerve which is exit out of this opening uh, which is an opening in the superficial and the uh, aponeurosis of external oblique we call it uh, superficial inguinal ring having medial crura and lateral crura connected by intracrural fiber so both the spermatic cord or round ligament in female and ilioinguinal nerve run in the inguinal canal and exit out of this superficial inguinal ring so the superficial inguinal ring is defined as a triangular opening in the aponeurosis of external oblique muscle above and lateral to the pubic tubercle it is formed of medial crust and lateral crust connected by intercrural fibers usually uh, during development the male testis develops inside the abdomen and during intrauterine life the male testis enters the inguinal canal and exit out of the superficial inguinal ring to reach the testis and because of that the male superficial inguinal ring is larger than the female superficial inguinal ring because of this fact the passage or the exit of the testis out of the superficial inguinal ring make it wider make it dilated uh, such an uh, exit is not seen in female so the superficial inguinal ring is smaller in female this uh, superficial inguinal ring is regarded as the outer opening of the inguinal canal or the end of the inguinal canal the beginning of the inguinal canal is an opening which is called deep inguinal ring it lies here in the fascia transversalis at this point which is called the point above the mid in, uh, above the mid inguinal line or above the mid inguinal point I'm, I'm concentrating not above the mid point of inguinal ligament no it is above the mid inguinal point the deep ring this deep ring as I said is an opening in the fascia transversalis it is the beginning of the inguinal canal while the superficial ring is the end of the inguinal canal you can see that uh, the deep ring which is uh, this one 
lies below the arching inguinal fiber of internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. With the origin insertion and uh, other anatomical aspect of the flat muscles of the anterior abdominal wall, we said that the inguinal ligament, part of its origin, is from medial two-third of uh, the internal oblique, I'm sorry, the internal oblique, part of its origin is from the uh, lateral two-third of the inguinal ligament. And the transversus abdominis have part of its origin from the lateral one-third of the inguinal ligament. Both the internal oblique and transversus ob abdominis muscles, the part of these muscles that originate from the inguinal ligament arch to form a conjoint tendon medially. And so we define the conjoint tendon as the tendon formed by aponeurosis of the arching inguinal fiber of internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. So you can see that the deep inguinal ring lies below the arching inguinal fiber of internal oblique and the transversus abdominis, and it is above the mid inguinal point, not the uh, uh, midpoint of inguinal ligament. Uh, the superficial inguinal ring surface anatomy is located above and lateral to the pubic tubercle. The superficial inguinal ring is above and lateral to the pubic tubercle, while the deep inguinal ring is above the mid inguinal point. This is a figure which shows you what is the difference between the midpoint of inguinal ligament that is the point between anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle. Above it is not the center of deep inguinal ring, while the midpoint of uh, mid inguinal point above it is the exact point of the deep ring. The mid inguinal point is the point between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic symphysis, not the pubic tubercle. And the middle of this line from anterior superior iliac spine to pubic symphysis, which is called the uh, mid inguinal point. Well, this is mid point of inguinal ligament. This is the point of deep inguinal ring. So, the inguinal canal starts from the deep inguinal ring, which is an opening in the fascia transversalis, ends at the superficial inguinal ring which is an opening in the aponeurosis of external oblique muscle. You can imagine that the arching fiber is internal oblique and transversus abdominis, both originating from the inguinal ligament. And so the space below the arch, this is the arch, the space below the arch is not internal oblique and is not uh, transversus abdominis. It is the structure deep to transversus abdominis because this is the arch is the internal and the transversus and below the arch this is what is deep to transversus which is fascia transversalis so you can see here also that this is fascia transversalis and this is an opening in fascia transversalis which is a deep inguinal ring while that is an opening in the aponeurosis of external oblique it is the superficial ring what other boundaries of the inguinal canal other than the beginning and the end? Anteriorly, the inguinal canal is uh, covered by skin, superficial fascia, and uh, aponeurosis of external oblique muscle. And laterally, a small part of the anterior wall is formed by the aponeurosis of internal oblique, only small part. This is because internal oblique originates from the lateral two-third of the inguinal canal. So this part may be considered as anterior wall with the external oblique aponeurosis. The posterior wall of the inguinal canal is simply parietal peritoneum, extra peritoneal connective tissue, fascia transversalis and medially 
a conjoined tendon. You can imagine that the arching inguinal fiber of internal oblique and the transversus abdominis medially unite. This is the internal oblique, yellow, and that is the transversus abdominis. Both unite the aponeurosis of arching inguinal fiber of internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. Unite medially to form the conjoint tendon. The conjoint tendon form the medial wall, uh, the posterior wall medially. And this figure is also demonstrating that. You can see here, below the arch, the posterior wall is fascia transversalis. But the arch will form conjoint tendon, so medially the posterior wall is conjoint tendon. You can see the posterior wall is formed laterally by fascia transversalis medially by the conjoint tendon. So, the anterior wall is skin, superficial fascia, aponeurosis of external oblique, and only laterally internal oblique. The posterior wall, fascia transversalis, extraperitoneal connective tissue, parietal peritoneum, or we can say parietal peritoneum, extraperitoneal connective tissue, fascia transversalis, and then only medially conjoint tendon. The roof, you can imagine that the roof is the arching fiber of internal oblique and transversus abdominis. I think this is also demonstrated here. You can imagine that this is the roof, the arching fiber of internal oblique and transversus abdominis form the roof of uh, inguinal canal only. The floor is simply inguinal ligament. The definition of the inguinal canal is a canal ab above the medial half of inguinal ligament. So surely the floor is inguinal ligament. And uh, the inguinal ligament shows an extension uh, medially, which is called lacunar ligament, extension from uh, the inguinal ligament on the medial side. So the floor is inguinal ligament, and only medially with it, with the inguinal ligament, is lacunar ligament. So I'll repeat on that figure. The anterior wall is aponeurosis, is skin, superficial fascia, aponeurosis of external oblique, and only laterally a muscle, which is internal oblique muscle. Posterior wall is fascia transversalis laterally below the arching fiber, and conjoint tendon medially. The roof is the arching inguinal fiber of internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. The floor is inguinal ligament and also medially lacunar ligament. The spermatic cord and the ilioinguinal nerve are contents of the inguinal canal. And if you take the cord and open the coverings of it, you will find that these are the constituents of the spermatic cord. It contains the vas deferens that it transmits the sperms from the testis. It contains nerves, ilioinguinal nerve and genital branch of genitofemoral nerve with sympathetic nerves, some arteries, which are testicular artery, trimasteric artery, artery of the vas deferens, veins accompany the artery, forming pomponiform plexus, lymphatics, areolar tissue, and remnant of a processes vaginalis, which is extension from the peritoneum with the spermatic cord and the testis. These constituents are covered by uh, coverings which are from inside to outside, internal spermatic fascia, cover the constituents of the cord. Outside the internal spermatic fascia is a cremasteric muscle and fascia, and to outermost is the external spermatic fascia. What is the embryological origin of this covering? Before 
minutes, we had said that the testis in male is formed inside the abdomen. And during intrauterine life, the testis exit from the abdomen into the scrotum. And actually, the exit of the testis from the abdomen into the scrotum is via the inguinal canal. So the testis will get out of the deep inguinal ring, pass through the inguinal canal, and then exit out of the deep ring to descend into the scrotum. And throughout this journey, the testis takes covering around it, and this covering are the external spermatic fascia, cremasteric fascia, and muscle, and the internal spermatic fascia. Therefore, the most inner covering, which is the internal spermatic fascia, is derived from fascia transversalis when the testis passes through the deep ring. You know, the deep ring of inguana ring is formed as an opening in fascia transversalis. So when the testis passes through the fascia transversalis, through the deep ring, it takes this covering, the internal spermatic fascia. Then the testis run in the inguinal canal. It will receive cremasteric muscle and fascia from the arching inguinal fiber of internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. Then when the, the testis exit out of the superficial inguinal ring, it will take external spermatic fascia from uh, the aponeurosis of external oblique that forms the superficial inguinal ring. And this is the figure to demonstrate that. It demonstrates that when the testis exit from the deep inguinal ring, it takes covering from it from fascia transversalis. The deep ring is an opening in fascia transversalis. And when further the testis descend in the canal, it takes coverings from internal oblique and the transversus abdominis as a cremasteric muscle and fascia. Then after when the testis exit from the superficial inguinal ring, which is the opening in aponeurosis of external oblique, it takes covering with it from the external oblique that form the superficial ring around it. This figure shows also that during this descent of testis from the abdomen into the scrotum, it pulls not only these coverings, but also it pulls part of the peritoneum with it. And this part is called processus vaginalis that must be closed after birth. And this is part of it, part of the peritoneum that is covering the testis. It is called the tunica vaginalis. It is the same of processus vaginalis, but the processus vaginalis is a tube which is closed after birth, the tunica vaginalis is still open. Sometimes the uh, processus vaginalis is not closed after birth, and some of the peritoneal fluid passes through this tube and accumulate around the testis, and it forms the hydrocele fluid around the testis, and it is corrected surgically, of course, by closing the processus vaginalis because it does not pros uh, close as usual. Regarding the topic of clinical application, this topic in regard to anterior abdominal wall must consider the hernia. Hernia may occur in the inguinal canal and is called femoral hernia, and usually such a hernia lies below the inguinal ligament and medially, while if the hernia is above the inguinal ligament, uh, it is an inguinal hernia. Inguinal hernia may be direct or indirect. What is the direct hernia? Direct hernia occurs when part of the intestine pushes the fascia transversalis below the arching in inguinal fiber of internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. We said that uh, internal oblique and the transversus abdominis take origin from the inguinal ligament. And this inguinal fiber of internal oblique and the transversus abdominis arching 
forming the roof of the inguinal canal, and they immediately fuse to form the conjoint tendon. So below this arching fiber is fascia transversalis forming the posterior wall. The posterior wall of the inguinal canal is formed laterally by fascia transversalis medially conjoint tendon. So direct hernia is uh, occur when the intestine pushes the uh, fascia transversalis below the arching inguinal fiber of internal oblique and the transversus abdominis. Usually it occurs just lateral to inferior epigastric artery. And we must say that the deep inguinal ring is also limited laterally by the inferior epigastric vessels. The inferior epigastric vessels is the lateral boundary of the deep inguinal ring. And uh, I'm sorry, it is a medial boundary of the deep inguinal ring. And it is a lateral boundary of the direct hernia. Such a direct hernia usually uh, pushes the anterior wall of the inguinal canal and uh, it does not exit out of the superficial inguinal ring. This region is called Hasselbach triangle, which is bounded medially by the lateral border of rectus abdominis muscle, which is called linea semilunaris bounded laterally by the inferior epigastric vessels and bounded inferiorly by uh, inguinal ligament. So medially inferior epigastric vessels, inferiorly inguinal ligament and uh, laterally inferior epigastric vessels, uh, inferiorly inguinal ligament and medially la uh, border of lateral border of rectus abdominis muscles. This triangle is called Hasselbach triangle. I'm, I'm describing that here. So this region, the Hasselbach triangle, contains fascia transversalis through which direct inguinal hernia occur. The figure shows also that the deep inguinal ring, which is opening in fascia transversalis, is lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels, while the direct hernia is medial to the inferior epigastric uh, vessels. So the direct hernia is uh, medial to inferior epigastric vessels. It is uh, occurring when intestine pushes the fascia transversalis and the Hasselbach triangle. What about the indirect hernia? This figure also shows the direct hernia. And this is femoral hernia below the inguinal ligament. The indirect hernia is occurring when intestine enters the deep inguinal ring running in the canal and may exit out of the superficial inguinal ring and descending to the scrotum. We said that the direct hernia does not usually exit out of the superficial ring and reaching the scrotum. The indirect pass it through the deep ring, run in the canal and exit from the superficial ring and may reach down to the scrotum. And this is the pathway of the indirect hernia. You can see it passes the indirect hernia, loop of intestine, passing it through the deep inguinal ring, running in the canal, exit of the superficial inguinal ring, getting out of the uh, superficial inguinal ring into the scrotum. And that is the explanation of it. Now we must consider the anatomy of the uh, uh, scrotum, testis, vas. Starting with the scrotum, which is also a part of the external genitalia of male, the scrotum is a sac uh, that contains the testis and the epididymis and also containing part of the spermatic cord. The scrotum is made of uh, many layers, including the skin. Deep to the skin, we have a muscle in the superficial fascia, which is called tartos muscle. Then, external spermatic fascia 
which is continuation of that fascia surrounding the spermatic cord. Then cremasteric muscle and fascia, continuation of the fascia, cremasteric fascia of the spermatic cord. And then internal spermatic fascia. The second layer, which is the dartos muscle, that is a muscle and the superficial fascia, uh, when it's contract, it pulls the testes and all the scrotum of the, all the content of the scrotum near to the body. And this condition occurs when the outside environment is cold, so the dartos will contract to bring the testes uh, near the body and thus the testis will have uh, good temperature from the body because the testicular function need warm environment. Usually the testis contains on the skin a medial graph uh, dividing it into right and left half and usually the left half uh, on a standing position is lower than the right because the left test testis descends more inferior than the right de testis uh, simply because the left spermatic cord is longer than the right spermatic cord uh, this is all about the scrotum the practical aspects of the anatomy of the testis describes that the testicles are uh, oval structures that are suspended from above by the spermatic cord the spermatic cord is attached to the upper pole of the testis of the oval testis and the testis is described to have an upper pole uh, related to the head of the epididymis and also have a lower pole and also the testis have anterior border and the testis has a posterior border that is related on the lateral aspect of the posterior border to the epididymis um, sometime you can see a space between the epididymis and the posterior border of the uh, testis from the uh, lateral side which is called sinus of the epididymis uh, on section you may see coverings of the testis the testis is covered by a serous membrane which is called the tunica vaginalis and if you remember in the uh, lecture of uh, spermatic cord which were which was one of the lectures in the abdomen that the spermatic cord also contain a process that is derived from extension of the peritoneum inside the cord which is called the processes vaginalis that the process is vaginalis if it is not degenerated uh, after birth some of the peritoneal fluid will pass through it resulting in a fluid accumulation around the testis which is called hydrocele القيل المائية so you can see that the tunica vaginalis is the continuity of the process is vaginalis but this is the continuity that surrounds the testis and you can see that this serous membrane of tunica vaginalis is formed of uh, an outer parietal layer and inner visceral layer and that it, this tunica vaginalis covers the testis on the sides and anteriorly only the posterior aspect of the testis is not covered by tunica vaginalis you can imagine that this parietal layer of tunica vaginalis is there so the parietal layer of tunica vaginalis lines the internal spermatic fascia deep 
to the tunica vaginalis, there is a fibrous tissue around the testis, the oval testis, this fibrous tissue from a capsule of a white substance or white fibrous tissue and it's called tunica albogenia and to inside of this tunica albogenia is a layer of a vascular layer which is called tunica vasculosa that is not demonstrated here because it is a histological layer seen by microscope and you can see that the fibrous tissue of the tunica albogenia sends septum to inside of the testis and thus dividing the testis into many lobules. Each lobule contains seminiferous tubules. And inside these seminiferous tubules, the sperms are produced. You can see that the sperms produced in each seminiferous tubule, in each of the lobules, will reach to a network of uh, tubules uh, lying on the posterior aspect of the testis. This network is called reti testis. And the fibrous tissue in which this network is located is called mediastinum testis. And sometimes this fibrous tissue uh, containing the network of reti testis is considered as a part of tunica albogenia. The textbook said that tunica albogenia is thickened posteriorly from mediastinal testis or mediastinum testis and this thickening, the mediastinum testis, thickening of tunica albogenia, contain the network of reti testis that receives sperms from the seminiferous tubule of each tubule. And you can see that uh, the uh, reti testis, when it will receive sperms from the seminiferous tubule. Uh, the sperms will pass then to the epididymis via many ducts at the upper part of the uh, testis. These ducts are called efferent ductules or vas efferentia. Actually, the testicles are supplied by uh, testicular archery, which is a branch from the aorta and it receives uh, or drains venous drainage by a plexus of vein which is called pomponiform plexus and the nerve supply to the testes of course it is autonomic the sympathetic part is derived from T10 segment of spinal cord and in that condition there is a clinical point if someone get a trauma, for example, a hit on the testis, he will feel pain at the umbilicus in the anterior abdominal wall. Why is that? Because the sympathetic innervation of the testis, as, as I said before a while, the sympathetic nerves supplying the testis are derived from uh, the sympathetic spinal, uh, from the spinal cord, the T10, the sympathetic nerve of the uh, testis is from T10 spinal cord segment, from the lateral horn of the spinal cord. And thus, if uh, uh, there is a hit or a trauma to the testis, the pain will pass via the sympathetic fibers and there will be a third pain in the interior abdominal wall at the level of the umbilicus because the dermatom of the skin at the level of the umbilicus is also T10. There are uh, certain clinical points in regard to the testis, for example. The testis develops inside the abdomen during embryonic life. But with development, the testis will descend gradually from the abdomen and then exit out of the deep inguinal ring and then the testis during development, during the intrauterine life will run after passing into the deep inguinal ring the testis will run in the inguinal canal and then exit out of the superficial inguinal ring and then descending down into the scrotum and at birth you must find the testis inside the scrotum otherwise uh, the testis is up in some position at these regions 
and it's called undescending testis usually uh, this is uh, a condition and there is another condition in which the testis is inside the scrotum but when the uh, newborn cries it will be retracted up in the inguinal canal and then return back and that condition is not called undescending it is called retractile testis the cause of descent of the testis during uh, intrauterine life and uh, during fetal life is that the lower pole of the testis is connected with the wall of the scrotum by a fibrous tissue which is called gubernaculum this gubernaculum becomes shorter and shorter with development and as this gubernaculum will become shorter it will pull the testis down gradually till putting it into the scrotum so this mechanism may be affected during uh, intrauterine life and so the testis will stay inside the abdomen or it may be inside the inguinal canal or in the deep ring or other superficial ring and of course you have to uh, do a surgical operation and stabilize the testis in the scrotum and suturing it into the wall of the scrotum simply because the testis inside the abdomen or in the inguinal canal will uh, expose will be exposed to high temperature more than it, uh, it requires for function and this high temperature will lead to atrophy and degeneration of the testis and uh, I don't know um, such an atrophy after 10 years carry uh, high risk of malignant transformation so you must do something for that during the early childhood you must bring the testis down into the scrotum uh, another thing is that you may find dilatation of the veins around the testis and uh, you will find that the pampiniform plexus is very dilated here and this is called varicocele of the testis again these dilated veins will produce extra temperature on the testis and it will result to uh, minimize the sperm production and uh, the low count of sperms may lead to infertility what about the epididymis? the epididymis is a comma shaped structure that lies on the lateral aspect of the posterior border of the testis it is formed of a head near the upper pole of the testis a body and a tail, a tail inferiorly from the tail you can see the vas difference ascending up on the medial side of the body of epididymis the head is connected by the vas efferent with the reti testis to receive sperms from it actually this comma shaped epididymis is formed of a single tubule that is coiled uh, and forming this comma shaped tubule it is not multiple tubules it is a one tubule which has about six meters in length that is coiled to form the comma shaped structure The vas, as we said, begins, the vas difference is a thick muscular tube. It begins uh, at the tail, the lower end of the epididymis, and ascends up, as you can see on the medial side of the body of epididymis. During that ascent, during that ascent it is tortuous in course also here it's so on then uh, the vas difference will uh, enter the spermatic cord and ascend inside the spermatic cord passing through the superficial inguinal ring and then running in the inguinal canal and then enters the abdomen via the deep inguinal ring then it turns backward and medially across the lateral aspect of inferior pigastic artery 
after that the vase will cross the ureter and external iliac vessels reaching the back of the urinary bladder which is the base of urinary bladder here the vase difference is dilated forming the so-called ampulla of the vase that is located on the medial side of the uh, sac of seminal vesicles and so both the ampulla of the vase difference and the seminal vesicles which is lateral to the ampulla are located behind the urinary bladder behind the base of urinary bladder then the vas difference unite with the duct of the seminal physical and the union of both forming the ejaculatory duct the ejaculatory duct perforates the prostate to open into the prostatic urethra and thus the seminal uh, fluid will uh, be uh, reached to the urethra and it will contain secretions from uh, the seminal vesicles, secretions from the prostate and also it contains sperms that comes from the testes via the vas deferens. Of course the vas deferens is uh, a muscular tube it carries very strong muscle and contraction of the muscle of the vas deferens is the force that pushes the seminal fluid out of the urethra during the ejaculation. Uh, sometime in some of the poor countries, they will do an operation at the inguinal canal, opening the inguinal canal and cutting the vas deferens as a procedure for sterility uh, of the male in order that sperms will not occur in the seminal fluids. Thus ejaculation will contain secretions from the seminal vesicles, from the prostate, uh, from the bulbo-urethral gland, but the ejaculating fluid will not contain sperms. The seminal vesicles are lobulated sacs, sac, lying on the back of urinary bladder. These are the seminal vesicles. Medial to them is the ampulla of the ductus of the vas deferens. The uh, vas deferens and the duct of the seminal vesicles uh, uh, unite to form the ejaculatory ducts that are opened into the prostatic urethra. Secretions of the seminal vesicles are uh, fluids that are added to the seminal fluid uh, ejaculated and it is uh, containing many of the important substances for the function of this 